Hello and welcome to my course on building web applications using Node.js and deploying them on AWS using their autoscaling containers, also known as AWS Fargate. Now, a bit of introduction. So why are we going to learn how to code using JavaScript? Well, JavaScript is one of the most used programming languages in the world. That has two very, very big advantages. One is the community support. Since there's so many people coding in JavaScript, that means that it's extremely probable that any issues or any bugs you run into, someone else will have run into them before you. And that's great because they will have probably posted about their bugs on forums such as Stack Overflow and you will have better, quicker, easier access to the solutions that you may be encountering when you're programming your application. The second and also very important point is the job availability. Since a lot of people, a lot of companies are programming using JavaScript and Node, there is a higher availability for jobs, which means that you are going to be more likely to eventually in the future find a job programming uh, JavaScript and Node, and that's why it's so helpful and useful to learn this language in the first place. Finally, but uh, not least, is that JavaScript is a fairly easy programming language to learn, which means it's easy to get into. The learning curve is not as steep as other programming languages, but that also doesn't mean that it's not capable. JavaScript is one of the most capable programming languages there is to date, uh, and that balance and mix of being fairly easy to learn how to program and its capabilities make it a great programming language to get uh, started with. So the second aspect of this course is that we're going to be deploying our application on AWS Fargate. Now, why use AWS Fargate? Well, AWS Fargate allows us to concentrate on coding our application in such a way that's fairly simple to do. Uh, we're going to be coding our application using a very traditional uh, architecture and, and layout of the application. Uh, and then we can simply dockerize or containerize that application and send it to Amazon and have Amazon deal with the rest. So no matter how much traffic you're going to be getting, AWS Fargate will manage the whole process of receiving inbound traffic and detecting if, for example, there's a big spike in traffic, it will automatically uh, spin up new instances of your containerized uh, JavaScript application and thus uh, be able to absorb that inbound traffic automatically all for you. So you will not have to worry about anything. Once your application is coded and you've set up AWS Fargate, once you've done that, you will not have to basically administer or set up anything else. Everything will be done for you and managed for you by AWS Fargate. And that's one of the convenient things about this is that it's also a very, very cost effective solution because uh, if your application is not receiving any traffic at all, then basically you're not paying for anything. And once you start getting traffic, then AWS Fargate, I mean, you have to receive quite a bit of traffic for AWS uh, Fargate to actually have to start to spin up a lot of instances on your application. So likely uh, you will not incur in any costs, uh, especially for the for for this course, right? So it's a very, very simple uh, solution and very practical solution to start uh, coding your applications using AWS Fargate. So what are the course goals and what will you learn? Well, to, to begin with, you'll learn how to code JavaScript if you don't already know how to do that. Uh, this course is intended for complete beginners. Uh, we won't go over too much detail of the super low level and beginner stuff uh, because quite frankly, I believe in the methodology of teaching uh, where you learn the things that you're actually implementing. Uh, so we will stick to practically no theory and just all hands-on getting your hands dirty with programming JavaScript and learn as you go. Second of all, you learn how to build a backend application using Express, which is a Node.js framework for building web applications. 
Uh, third, you'll learn how to do a or build a backend application that makes API calls to external APIs. We're going to build a very, very simple web application. Uh, and then you're going to learn how to host that on AWS Fargate. As I've said before, AWS Fargate has a slight learning curve when it comes to setting it up. But once that's set up, which I will help you do, uh, then it's all basically, uh, you know, AWS managing everything and, and you won't have to do any other administration or setup or managing of anything else other than building your application and the code for your application. And finally, if you want, optionally, you will be able to purchase your own domain name if you don't have one already and link it to your application that's running on AWS Fargate. So all of these are the things that you are going to learn over the course of, of this course. So what are some prerequisites for this course? Well, first and foremost, if you want to deploy your application on AWS, then obviously you will need a, a AWS account which you can open up on aws.amazon.com. Second of all, you will need a code editor. I'm going to be using VS Code because it's a great and more importantly, free code editor, which everyone has access to. I also recommend using JetBrains WebStorm if you have it, but that's a paid code editor. Finally, you will need to install Node. Uh, Node is very, very easy to install. It's only a couple of steps, be it on Windows, Linux, or Mac. I've left the notes and slides for, for the instructions to install Node on each platform, uh, as you can see here. And there's also a separate course further along as you progress uh, through the course lectures. Uh, you will encounter a course on how to install Node if you haven't done that already on your computer. All right, so with a bit of theory out of, the, out of the way, let's start to the actual fun part, which is the actual programming of our Express application. So right before we start, I just want to mention uh, one small thing. Uh, we're going to be building a Express application, which is going to represent a to-do list. We're going to build it in such a way which is optimized for learning. Uh, it might not necessarily be what a seasoned developer might do and then upload as a function in web app to, to the cloud, in this case that we're going to do with AWS Fargate. But instead, it's, it's made for anyone beginning with Express or, or Node or JavaScript to learn the basics on how to build the Express application. Uh, and then from there, uh, you can do more advanced courses on how to, for example, integrate databases and, and store and persist data, so on and so forth. Uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be storing data on the actual uh, hard drive as, um, as just uh, physical files. We're not going to be using a database just because this course is very, very short and it's intended to cover the very basics of programming and getting a Express application up and running. However, we are going to complete a functioning, functioning backend to-do list app. So what this app is going to do is it's going to enable you to see to-do lists that you have, uh, complete them and create new ones basically. And that's it, right? That's a very, very simple to-do list app. And that's what we're going to be doing. So uh, let's get started. Uh, I have Visual Studio Code open here. Uh, I've opened up a directory where I want to uh, place all my files and build the actu actual project from this directory. And I've opened up the terminal. So the way you do this is terminal, new terminal, and this will pop up. And as you can see here, we're inside of this directory. And so the first thing you want to do with any node application is to hit npm init dash y. Okay, so what this will do, and, and by the way, if this command doesn't work, then you haven't uh, properly installed Node in NPM. So please refer back to the documentation on the previous lectures on how to do that. Um, so what this command does is, as you'll see in just a second, it will create a new file in this directory. Here we have it, package.json. Package.json is a standard file that any node project has, and it represents the kind of like the structure uh, of your project, right? So right now this file is pretty empty. It's got some default values, name, version, so on and so forth. But we're gonna need to, to build on top of this. But right now, any, uh, any command, any node command you would do in this directory 
it would recognize that this is a node project and hence, you know, uh, you can do different node commands in, inside of this project, right? So the first thing we're going to do is, uh, since we're going to be using Express.js to, um, you know, to, to create our web application, we need to install the Express.js library inside of this project. This, right now, this project is empty. There's nothing inside of this folder aside from package.json. So the way we want to install Express is say npm install Express dash dash save. The dash dash save is important because as we'll, as we're going to see in just a second, um, one of the things that package.json does is it holds all the different dependencies of our project. So what other third party libraries are needed in order for our project to run, right? And, and by, uh, doing dash dash save, what we're telling the npm install command is that not only do we want to install express in our project, but we also want to save it as a dependency or, or you know, explicitly uh, save it as a dependency in our package.json file. So I'm going to hit enter and wait till it installs. And here, as you can see, uh, we see that uh, the npm command has automatically updated our dependencies list and it has included, included Express.js. Okay, so with that out of the way, now we can also see actually, it's worth mentioning, we can see a new folder that's, that's, that has been created. It's called node underscore modules. What this fol folder contains is all the different libraries that are needed for a project to run. Uh, and these are all their different third party libraries that we, we install with these NPM commands, right? And, and as you can see, Express here, but we can also see that there's a ton of other different projects that have been installed already together with Express. And why is this? Well, it's because Express.js has its own dependencies as well. Uh, so our project is going to depend on Express, but Express also depends on all of these different libraries that NPM has you know, automatically installed for us. So like that, you know, we don't need to keep track of what dependencies Express has. NPM already knows that and installs all the different depending libraries for us. Okay, so now let's close this. Let's create a new file and call it index.js. And this is where we're going to actually code our application. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, the first thing we're gonna need is we need to import Express. So the way we do this is we declare a new variable. We're going to declare it using the const keyword because we want the variable to be constant. We're not going to be changing this variable uh, down the line. And we're just going to call it express and we're going to set it equal to require, sorry, require open brackets and as a string type express. Okay. So now what we've done here is we are telling Node to load the Express library or Express framework and then just store it in the Express variable. The next thing we, we want to do is we want to create an app, uh, an Express app. So the way you do this now in Express is we want to create another variable and we're just going to call it app. So again, const app is equal to Express. And the way you initialize an Express application is you just open and close parentheses. So now not only have we imported the Express framework, but we've also initialized a app, a functioning Express app. And from here onwards, it's very fairly simple. We can uh, start to code the actual endpoints. Um, but before we do that, it's probably worth mentioning how endpoints work in the first place. Okay, so I've opened up a new browser window and let's just see, let's just go to google.com, right? Okay, I agree. Okay, so how do requests work and how does the actual web work? So what I'm doing here is I'm opening up the inspector tool in Chrome. Uh, most browsers have this, Firefox has this. I'm using Chrome. Um, you don't need to do this, this is just to explain how, how websites work. So I'm going to hit, uh, hit inspect and I'm just going to rearrange this. So it's a bit easier to see. Okay. Okay. So now if I hit network and I hit refresh, you can see that there's a lot of things happening here. So all of these things, all of these lines here represent requests that my computer has done to Google in order to load the website, Google. 
so, for example, the first one that that uh, we uh, that you know that's appearing here is a request URL to Google go to Google.com forward slash and then a couple of parameters here. It's a GET request. So this is basically telling that our computer has done a GET request to this URL, which represents Google, and then Google has responded back with what's called a response. So our computer is sending a request and Google is sending a response to that request. And that's essentially how the internet works. It's all uh, computers making requests to servers and servers sending responses back to, to us. And so here you can see um, the response that Google has, or response headers that Google has sent to us. You don't really need to worry about this, but this is basically some metadata about uh, the response that Google is sending back to us. Uh, more headers on the request that we sent to Google. And then for the actual response itself, you can see that this is the actual code that Google sent to us. And it represents, and then the browser, what the browser does is it interprets this code and then builds this visual representation of this code. And that's, this is basically how, how websites work, right? So in essence, all you need to understand is that whenever you, Type in a URL, for example, if you're browsing the web, what, what your computer is doing is it's sending a request to this URL. And then that request basically holds some information that it's a request of type get. Uh, you're requesting this exact URL. Uh, later, so it also sends the uh, IP address uh, for, for, um, for, you know, our connection so on and so forth, and then the server comes back with a response. And that response can hold anything. In this case, it's the code to, for, the, for the browser to understand how to build the visual representation, right? Okay, so with that done, we can start programming the instructions for our application to handle these requests and kind of you know tell our our application what it needs to, it needs to send back as a response okay so we are going to be building a back end application so that means that we're only going to be dealing with the back end side of things so that's the actual business logic um that you know um processes the request and then sends information back down to the client to to the anyone using our backend application, right? So we're not going to be building a visual representation of our application in this course. We're just going to be dealing with the backend. Um, you might have you know, seen or heard about APIs. Essentially, what we're going to be doing is building a API uh, because we're not building the front end. We're not building the visual representation since we're only sticking to the back backend. You can say that what we're building is a API for our to-do list, right? Okay, so let's get started. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna just uh, build a quick hello world example to see if our Express application is up and running successfully. So the way we're gonna do this is we're, we're gonna say app.get, uh, app.get because it's a get request that we wanna do to the root directory. So that's why we're, we're gonna type in a forward slash as a string. And that's the first parameter. The second parameter is essentially uh, we need to define what's called a callback function in JavaScript, which is going to be processing the request to this uh, root directory, right? So the way this works in Express is um, any callback function in what's called a HTTP handler, which is what we're defining here, has two parameters. It has a request and a response. So request Express is going to be calling, whenever it receives a HTTP request to this uh, path, it's going to be sending both the request and the response information to our function handling this request. And the way, so we have to capture the request and response and then the, you know, the body of the function, we need to define what we're going to be doing with the request and the response. So since this is a very, very quick hello world example, what we're gonna do is we're gonna simply return the response dot and we're gonna send a quick text, hello world. And this is basically it, right? So 
anytime we hit the root directory of our Express application, we're just going to be sending a text which says, hello world. The final thing that we need to do is we need to get our Express app up and running. And the way we do this is we need to define what port on our machine it, what's the it, it needs to listen to for inbound traffic. So the way we do this is we say app.listen. We need to define the port. Typically on Express applications, you just do the, um, the port 3000. And again, the callback fun function for the listen is basically Express doesn't send us anything. So we just close, open and close parentheses because Express is not sending us anything. It's just a you know callback with no inputs um, as to tell us that it, uh, the listen has started. So in our callback function, the only thing we're going to do is we're going to console log and say application running on HTTP uh, forward slash forward slash local host column 3000. Okay, because we're expecting it to be up and running on this directory. Okay, so we've basically finished coding our hello world example. Now what we can do is we can just say note index.js and sure enough, it says our application is running on localhost 3000. This is, you know, what we've typed in here. Now, if you command click in my case, because I'm on a Mac, you know, we, we go to the root direction and we can see that it's working. So this is excellent. Okay, so now let's get into the actual interesting part, which is um, let's code a, uh, a to-do list. So I'm going to stop the server uh, because every time we update the code, we need to restart the server for now. There are ways to get around that. But for now, for this course, uh, we're just going to be restarting the server manually. I'm going to uh, say also clear just to have a clean, clean console. Um, okay, so let's get into the programming of the uh, to-do list. So I'm going to create a new folder. I'm going to call it store because this is going to act kind of like our database. Again, we're not really uh, going to use a database in this course, just because it's a super introductory and quick course. Um, so we're not going to use the database. Instead, we're going to be storing files physically on the hard drive in this directory. So just create a new directory, call it store. And inside here, I'm going to create a new file called to do's, sorry, to do's dot JSON. Okay. And here I'm just going to copy and paste a, a bit of code. Uh, I'll leave it so that you can copy and paste it as well for yourself. But essentially, if I just um, structure this so it's a bit easier to see, what you're going to start to see is a what's called a list. Anytime there's squared brackets in JavaScript, that represents a list. So it's kind of like a collection of items, right? Uh, and in this list, we have three items, uh, three objects, as you call them in JavaScript. Uh, they have a couple of properties, an ID, a name, and a complete. So the idea is a number, one to three. Name is, you know, the name of the to-do list. So learn JavaScript, walk the, go walk the dog, and go shopping. And then the third property is complete. So if it's complete or not. So right now, none of these to-do lists are complete. Okay, so I'm just going to save this. I'm going to exit. Okay, so now to start to be able to, you know, access that information we just stored there, we're going to need to import a new library. This library is called fs, which is shorthand for file system. So const fs is equal to require again, and we're just going to type in fs. This time we do not need to npm install fs because fs is a library that comes already with node itself, right? So you do not need to install this one. This is kind of, you know, a native library for Node.js. So I'm going to hit save. And now what we're going to do is we're going to create a new endpoint. So this endpoint is going to be app.get as well, forward slash to do's. Okay. And again, request response. This is what uh, Express.js sends us. And now what we're going to do is we need to figure out a way on how to read this file that, you know, that, that we've just saved here and then send all of those to do lists, uh, items, to the user as they request, you know, this, this endpoint. So the way we do this is we've already imported FS, which is going to be the library that we're using to read files off of the disk. So we can say FS read file. 
It's uh, basically a property of this library. And now the first uh, thing that we need to tell uh, the read file kind of uh, method is actually my, my, you know, Visual Studio Code is actually hinting. We need to pro provide the path. So what file do we need to open or where is it located? So in Node, what we can do is we can pass as a string the relative path to this file. So relative means from starting from this directory, which is our project directory, how do we go about to find this file? So if you can, if you remember, we created a, a folder called store and then, you know, the file is just to do's.json. So basically from the project directory, directory, we need to go into the store folder and open to do's.json. So the way you, you do this in, in Linux or in Mac, I'm not sure if it's a bit different in, in Windows, but the way you do this is uh, you, you type in a dot, which represents a, a dot in, in, in Linux or, or, or Mac represents the current working directory. So the current working directory is our project directory. And from the current working directory, we need to go into store and then we need to, you know, open to do's.json. Okay. We want to specify that we want to open uh, this file as UTF-8 encoding. I'm not going to go into detail on what this means, but basically if we would skip this argument, then uh, this read file uh, function would open up our, the file as a byte array or as a buffer. Uh, we don't want to do that because we actually want to read it in plain English. Uh, so that's why we're, we're telling it to encode the file as UTF-8. So like that, you know, we can just read it as, as, as plain English, uh, basically read it as it is stored in here. Right. Okay. So the next thing read file is going to, um, you know, tell us to define is the actual callback function. So what do we do after the read file is complete? And here, um, you know, uh, visual studio code is hinting that there's two parameters that we need to take care of an error. So what happens, for example, if read file doesn't manage to open the file because maybe, you know, if this file doesn't exist or I've misspelled the directory or whatever it may be. Um, so it, it will return an error in some cases and the data itself if it's successful. Okay. So, okay. So let's uh, type in the actual body of our function. So the first thing I like to do is first get rid of the error. So what happens if there's an error, what do we do? Okay. Uh, it's not actually getting rid of the error. It's, it's more like, you know, processing it or handling it. So if error, um, what are we going to do? Well, basically the only thing we can do is we can just say return response. So we're going to say, okay, we're gonna, just going to tell the user that, um, sorry, we couldn't find any, any to do's. Um, please come back again later. It shouldn't really happen if we've programmed it correctly, but you know, you never know. Um, so let's just take care of the error, uh, as our first order of operation. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to say, uh, response that status 500, which is not really good practice. You shouldn't really be doing this. Um, but it's basically eight, uh, this is, uh, telling express to send a HTTP status code of 500. Um, so a, a quick introduction on what HTTP status codes are. So again, I, I've gone back to open Google and I'm going to go back to the first request that we have already seen. And here you can see that the status code was 200. 200 is a good status code. It's, it's basically telling, um, your browser that everything was okay. And Google found the content that you were looking for and it sent to you and there was no problem. So status codes starting with a, a two are good, uh, status codes with starting with a four are any kind of user generated error. So that's, for example, you know, when you're uh, requesting a website to Google that doesn't exist, that's the famous 404 error. That's a error considered generated, um, on the user end because you're requesting a website uh, or a page that doesn't exist on the server. And uh, status codes starting with a five are server side errors. So this is basically not the user's fault. It's a, a, a server error that's uh, happened and thus, you know, it's not really your fault. And this is probably something that the company or the website should fix. Okay. So we're sending in a status code of 500 because, you know, you know, this should work. 
if it doesn't, it's for some kind of strange reason, you know, and it's, it's current kind of our, our mistake. And so we're just going to send in a text. Sorry. Something went wrong. Okay. Sorry. Typo. Something went wrong. Okay. So this is where we're going to send. Uh, again, this shouldn't really happen. Okay, so now the, what happens if, um, you know, okay, so since we're actually returning something in an error, anytime you re return a piece of code, then the execution stops here, right? The, the code won't go further down. Uh, so you can rest assured that if there's an error, then the code will stop here and, and whatever we keep typing here will not execute. But, but that's, that's a great advantage and that allows us to have our, our code, you know, be, be programmed in a cleaner way because if there's not an error, you know, then, then basically it will not go into here and our execution of the code will continue. And like that, you know, we can have code which is slightly easier to read, right? Okay, so now uh, there's no error. Uh, what do we do with the data? Well, basically what we need to do is we need to load the content of, of the data, which is being passed here as a callback function, but it's being passed as a string. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to say const to do's is going to be equal to json.parse data. Now, why are we doing this? So as I said before, uh, we're reading the fi this file in plain English, and what we're receiving here is a string. Uh, a string is basically just, you know, plain text that uh, we're receiving, uh, but we want to, you know, parse this as a JSON file because this in essence is a JSON file. And we want to make sure that we're parsing when, when read file reads this as a string, we just want to make sure that we're parsing it as, as a JSON. So the final thing that we want to do is we want to return a response dot json a json of and we're going to say to do's is going to be the content of to do's okay so like that what we're expecting is an object with a a key of to do's and the content of or the content associated to this key will be a list of to do's you know the same as as we have here right okay so this should be working let's do node index again uh, access our web app and we need to access the to do's endpoint. Okay, so sure enough, we can see that our to do's are being loaded. So this is great. Now, instead of uh, moving forward, instead of using our browser to, um, you know, check for our to do's, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a tool called Postman. Postman is a tool that allows you to do HTTP requests and test them and kind of have like a you know, more convenient way to do these requests instead of doing a browser. Okay, so I have Postman open. And like I said before, this is just kind of like a more convenient way to do requests when you're building APIs and backend applications. So uh, you can download this for free. Uh, it's totally free to use. Uh, I'll leave the link to, to the URL to download this um, in the description of the course. Um, or you can just Google, you know, download Postman and, and you'll have it there. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to replicate the HTTP request that we're doing to our to-do list to uh, just have it here, right? So HTTP, uh, first line, first line, local host 3000. Uh, this will give us the hello world, but we want the to-dos. Okay, great. Right, so we can immediately see that right? this is much more convenient to, to, to see what we're getting back, right? Uh, it's well formatted and, and everything's just nice. Okay, so let's go back to, to our code. Now, uh, you know, this is all working, which is great. Uh, so the next thing that uh, we want to do is we want to be able to maybe complete a to do. So we're going to build that right now. So let's say app. So let's say app dot put. Now we're doing a put instead of a get request. Because typically in REST APIs, this is the, the, the better way to do things, right? Not everything is going to be a GET request. And there's a lot of theory about why should something be a GET and a PUT and a POST and so on and so forth. There's uh, a couple of different types of um, HTTP requests that you can do. 
I won't go into too many details, um, but just know that you know the best practice is to create a put request instead of a get request for these types of types of things. Um, main reason being because put requests are basically to update a resource. So if if you have a resource, so a resource is for example a to do item. If you know your to do item and you you, you just want to update it, then typically you do a put request. You know it's a verb, right? I'm putting information to that resource, right? Um, so that's what we're going to do here. Uh, and the way we're going to do this is we're going to say to do's uh, and then for slash. So this is going to be within the to do's, um, let's say, tree of our path. We're going to say, uh, you know, colon ID because this is going to be a parameter that we're going to be picking up. So this can be anything. Uh, and then for slash, we're going to say complete. So this is going to be a put request that we're doing to, you know, mark a to do item of ID of whatever we were going to be sending in the URL to be complete. Again, request response as usual, we're going to create a function. Okay. Now here we need to see how can we handle this, you know, to do item and mark it complete. So the first thing we want to do is we want to pick up the ID that's coming in through the URL parameters. So the way you do this is we're going to say, we're going to create a new variable called ID and we're going to set it as a const again, because we're not going to be updating that ID. And what we're going to do is we're going to say request the parameters, oops, sorry, uh, params dot ID params being short for parameters. And again, this is provided to us by the express framework. So now we're picking up the ID uh, and what we want to do is now we want to load up the different to do's in this file and get the one, the right one and update its complete attribute to be true. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to say FS dot again, read file. Oops, sorry, read file. And we're going to say again in the store in to do's dot JSON. Okay. We're going to want it as UTF eight as usual. And it's sending us the error and the data in, in the callback. Okay. And we've accidentally deleted a close parenthesis there. Okay. So all is good here. Now again, uh, we're just going to copy and paste this error because it's going to be the same thing. If we don't find it, which would be very strange in our case, we're just going to send a status code of 500 and sorry, something went wrong. Right now, the interesting thing is going to be, uh, again, you know, we're going to copy this const do's is equal to JSON parse of the data. Now, what we want to do is we want to find the appropriate to do in this to do list. And the way we're going to do that is to use this ID and get the to do by the ID, right? So if you remember here, we have a bunch of IDs, one, two, three. Um, if we find the right one, then great. If we don't, we need to return a 404 error. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to just create a, another function inside of this handler. And we're going to say const, uh, find, find to do by ID is equal to a function right now. We're just going to do this like that. So this is basically defining a new function in JavaScript. We're calling this function find to do by ID. And right now we're not getting accepting any parameters. We're going to change this in just a second. Then we're, we have an empty, uh, function body. So this function is going to accept two parameters. It's going to accept the to-do lists and a ID that we're looking for in this to-do lists uh, array. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a for loop. Uh, and the way you create the way you create for loops uh, or the simple way you do that in JavaScript is a for open parentheses, and then you need to do three parameters. You, you need to set a iterator value. So this is basically a value that keeps keeps track of what item are we on, right? So any list in most programming languages starts with what's called a index of zero. So the first item is, is the item number zero, let's say, and then, you know, it progresses um, in, by incrementing uh, one each time, right? So let's keep track of the index in this case. And we say let i short for index is equal to zero. And then we're going to say, 
i is less than to do's dot length because uh, what, what this does is it tells this list that it needs to finish sometime, right? It's, it can't just go on forever. So as long as I, so this index uh, counter, let's say, is less than the length of items inside the to-do list, we're good, right? We, we can continue to, to move forward. And then we need to also tell it how are we going to be incrementing these values, right? So we start at zero and we cannot go above the length of the number of items in the to-do list, but we also need to tell it by how much it needs to increment each time. So in this case, we're just gonna say by, we know we need to increment by one and the short form to write this is just to say plus plus, I plus plus. I plus plus in JavaScript means that we're going to be updating the value of I by one each time. Now, the body of this for loop is going to contain basically a little bit of logic, which is, and, and we're going to say if to do's, and we're going to, you know, to do's is the entire list, right? But we want to go one by one. We want to start with this one, then we're going to, we want to go to this one, and then finally we want to go to this one, right? So that's why this i is going to come in handy because this keeps track of which one are we going over. Uh, so we want to go into each item and the way you go into each item is you open open square brackets uh, with the to do's variable uh, is, again this is a list you open square brackets and you say okay I want to go to the zeroth item or I want to go to the first item which is in actual fact the second item uh, because you, remember it's always indexed with zero so it's always one less uh, and or I want to go to the third item right so this is the, the way you would access each individual item inside the list. So instead of, you know, just hard coding it to a fixed number, we're going to say, you know, just go into the ith element because this keeps changing, right? So if um, to do's, uh, you know, the, the nth or the ith, <laughs> it's a bit difficult to, to pronounce. If the ith element of to do's um, dot id is equal to the id that's sent into the function, then what we're going to do is we're just going to return the, the, the index of this item, right? And it's gonna stop the execution here, where anytime you return the item, the execution stops inside of this, this function in this case, right? And if we don't find the element, then we need to return something else. And in this case, we're just gonna be returning a minus one, and like that we'll know that it hasn't found the element because basically it's impossible uh, for this to re to return a minus minus one because it starts at zero, it goes up each time. Uh, so if we if we receive a minus one with this function, then we know it hasn't found this. And this is, by the way, a common pra practice in many functions in in native JavaScript. Okay, so that's done. Um, the next thing that uh, we need to do is we need to you know find the actual index of this file using our function. So the way we do this is we're going to say to do to do uh, index is going to be find to do by index. So we're going to pass in all of the to do's in JSON format. If we just pass the string, this wouldn't work because you know again we're iterating over a, an actual object, not a string, and we're expecting to receive the ID that we're capturing here, right? So again, ID. So it's uh, passing this ID into, oops, sorry, passing this ID into the function, and this should basically, you know, find the actual to do for us. So just to make sure that everything's working, let's just uh, return response.json, and let's just say uh, to do's, and we're gonna be indexing into the to do's index, right? to do index, right? One thing we need to do is if, sorry, if I forgot to do this. If to do's index is equal to minus one, then we haven't found it and we can already do this. We can return a response of status code 404 and send a text of sorry, not found, okay? And if it does find this, then we can, for now, uh, we haven't finished, but we can just, uh, you know, return the, the actual to-do item, right? So let's restart the server, 
go back to our postman and let's just duplicate this tab and then say to do's one. Okay, we have some sort of error. Oh yes, of course, because it's not a get, it's a, a put. <clears throat> and we still have an error, so let's figure out what's going on. Ah, yeah, of course, uh, of course, the, the URL was incorrect. Sorry, not found, one. Why is this happening, right? So, so we're saying we're accessing one, so it's working, uh, at least it's working, but it's not working in the way we want it to. Um, so we're trying to access to do one, and for some reason it's not finding it, right? So let's see what's happening. Okay, so we are receiving a parameter here, and this parameter comes in the string form. So Express always uh, returns strings in these parameters. While here, our to-dos are coded as numbers. If you see, you know, if we change this now, this will work, but this is not what we're intending. I'm just doing this to, to show um, how strings and numbers are different in, in any programming language, quite frankly. So if we go back here and we say one, this is now going to find the string. As you can see, it's found it, right? And the, the reason why it's found it is because here, um, you know, types are very, very important in programming languages. It's not the same thing to look for one as a string as it is to look for one as a number. And the way we're doing this here is we're doing a strict equals, a triple equals, which means it's comparing uh, not only the actual value, but also the type of, of what we're sending here, right? So I'm gonna go back here and delete this because I don't want this to be a string. Um, and instead here, what we're going to do is we're going to say, we're going to parse this, whatever we're sending here as, and, and we want it to be a number, right? So parse int and whatever we're sending is, if this is a string, then we're going to try and turn it into a number, right? So anything now, as we're collecting here a string and ultimately we're passing it into this function and we're converting the string to a number, this should work, right? So I'm gonna restart the server, go back to Postman. And now again, this should work and this should be represented as a number. Okay, great, excellent. Right, so this is working. Now the last thing we need to do is we just need to update the this uh, to-dos index. And by the way, this can no longer be a const because we're actually updating it. So we need to say that it's a let now. Um, let is basically the same thing as a const, but then it, it allows you to modify the content or, or the, yeah, the value of these anything you're storing here. So to do so index dot complete is equal to true, right? So we're updating the value of the complete uh, key inside of each to do to be complete. Now, the last thing that we need to do is we need to write the file. We need to update the file here on disk, right? So the, thing, the, the way we do this is we say fs dot write file uh, where we, the first thing that we need to send again is the path store dot to do's dot json. And then we just need to say, you know, what are we going to be writing to this file? So the way we're going to do this is we're going to say json stringify to do's. Okay. What is this doing? Uh, this is basically picking up the object that we have here in, in, in you know, in, in, in our application. And we're turning this JSON object back to a string. Uh, the way we do this is because, you know, native file systems cannot really store a JSON. JSON is an object that's parsed in memory. Uh, so whenever we store something, we typically have to store it as a string. Um, so that's why we need to convert it back to a string. And that's where json.stringify comes in handy. Okay, and then the callback so the write file callback doesn't really return us anything here. Uh, we can just receive or access this callback function once we're done, right? So here, once we're done, we can simply just return a response to the user and say JSON, JSON response. This is not really you know, going to contain anything useful. Uh, we're just gonna tell the user that the status was okay. So basically just indicating the user that we have successfully marked the to-do item as complete, right? So I'm gonna go back here and as you can see, right now, the to-do item number one is not complete. The complete is false. I'm gonna quickly restart the server. 
go back to here, launch this. It says status okay, which we can think that everything has gone correctly. And as you can see here, all of a sudden, uh, the to do with item number one or ID number one is complete. So everything is working. Excellent. So now if we go back here and call to do's again, the list of to do's, we can see, you know, as we saw before, the item with ID number one is complete, which is great. Now we can, you know, take the opportunity to create a improvement in our to do's endpoint. So let's go back to our endpoint that deals with all of the to do's, the list of to do's. And here, what we can do is we can basically filter out all of the complete ones, right? Or we can leave it optional for the user. Like, th does the user want all of the to-dos or do they only want the complete ones? So the way we're going to do this is we're going to pick up a query parameter that the user can send. So we're going to say show only complete is going to be equal to request query dot show complete. Okay, so. What we're doing here is we're allowing the user to send us a query parameter, which I'll show you in just a second what it means, uh, called show complete. And if there's anything in this query parameter, then we will just filter out all of the, um, all of the, um, sh sorry, this should be actually um, show pending. Show pending, right? I think that's the more intuitive way of representing to-do lists, right? So show only pending items. Okay. Right. So how do we implement this? So the way we're going to do this is if show pending, sorry, show pending is not e strictly equal to the string of one, then we're just going to send back everything, right? So we're going to just cut, we'll cut and paste this there. And then we're going to say else, sorry, else. And then here we're going to filter them out, right? So what are we doing here? Okay, let's step, let's take a step back. We're going to be accepting a show pending query parameter. So if this go, if this is going to be anything other than one, so it can be either not existing. So the, the user can maybe just not send us this, or it can be anything other than one. Um, we're just going to send the full list back. However, if the user sends us the show pending query parameter equal to one, then we're just going to filter out everything that's complete and just leave out the pending ones, right? So what I'm, going, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy and paste this code. But here, instead of sending all of the to-dos, what I'm going to do is I'm going to filter them. So I'm going to say to-dos.filter. And here, what I'm going to do is the filter function, it uh, iterates over each item in the list. So in this case, to do. So I'm just going to call it uh, in its short form, just say T. And here in, in you know, the filtering logic, I'm going to say uh, return uh, if t.complete is equal to false. So this is the logic that I'm going to be using to basically see if t.complete is false, then, you know, I want this to be included here. If it's true, then it's not going to be included uh, by the filter function, right? So let's just see if this is running. I'm going to just quickly restart the server. I'm going to go back here and then in to do's, I'm going to say, I'm going to add the query parameter. So it's called show pending. I'm going to copy and paste it here is equal to one. Excellent. As we can see, item number one has been removed from the list because we only want the pending ones. So the ones that are complete equal to false. Now, if we say, you know, pending equal to zero, it's included again. Or if we just downright, you know, just not include this query parameter, it's also included. Right. Excellent. Everything is working. Okay. So the last endpoint that uh, I would like to create in this project is one where we can actually add a to-do list. So typically for adding items, you use a post request. That's exactly what we're going to do. And we're going to post to to-do because it's an individual to-do that we're creating. Um, and we're going to say request response as usual, open up here, and we're going to process the actual request 
the post request to create a to-do item. So the first thing we want to do is uh, actually before we start, we need to ma make a couple of small modifications to our Express application. So at the very top, uh, when you declare your application, let's <coughs> we need to make Express use certain middleware that it comes with. Okay, so I'll explain this in just a second. For the time being, what we're going to do is we're going to say app.use uh, express.json and we're going to say app.use express.url encoded open parentheses open curly braces extended and we're going to say colon true. Okay, so what are we doing here? I'm not going to go into too much detail. You can just copy and paste this, but basically um, post requests come in different shapes and sizes. Um, and the way we're going to be using uh, post requests is more of a, you know, JSON API type way, which is, you know, you need to configure Express to kind of be able to understand that it's in that type or that kind of, you know, format. So these two lines just tell Express, okay, we're, we, we want to parse certain post re requests as they, as they would be um, a typical JSON API, right? I'm not going to go into too much detail, just copy and paste this code. Okay, so now that we've done that, uh, we can continue writing our application. And what we're going to do is we're going to say if, you know, the request doesn't come in with the expected, you know, payload that we require to create a new to-do list, then we need to tell the user that, you know, they've basically sent us the wrong request. So if not request, so that's why we're adding this, you know, bang here. It's called a bang. I uh, see exclamation mark, but in coding, it's called bang. If if bang request dot body dot name. So if name is not inside of the body of the request, then we just need to return response dot status a four hundred. So this is something that the user has uh, sent badly to us and we're going to send a message of missing name. So a missing name of the to do item. Okay. If that is however present, the code is not going to enter here and we're going to continue. And what we're going to do is FS read file, read file, again, same location store to do's.json, uh, again, UTF eight again error data you already know this uh just going to copy and paste the error code for managing sorry this is if error right we can move this inside Okay, so now that we have data, um, again, we need to also process the data by doing json.parse of the data. Okay, great. Now, we have the list loaded as a JSON object, and we need to add an item to, the list, to this list. Um, so the way we need to add this is, um, you know, obviously we need a new ID for this item that we're going to be assigning ourselves, as in, you know, our application is going to be assigning. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to say, we're going to pick up what's the maximum ID that's already present in this list, right? So in, th in this case, it's going to be three. So in order to do that, so we're going to say max ID is going to be equal to math. We're going to be using the math, the built-in math library uh inside of javascript and we're going to say get them sorry max uh, and apply because it's going to be you know uh, a mapping of the max function that we're running over the list of items so again just um we're going to say math to do's dot map t i'll explain this in just a second return t dot id okay okay so what are we doing here we're using the math max. So as you, you know, you can probably your intuition is saying, okay, we're, we're kind of mapping the max function over a list of to-dos. But, you know, since to-dos is not 
a simple object with just numbers in it. It has a bit of structure to it. We need to tell this math max library how to or, or which values are we kind of figuring out the max for, right? And we want to figure out the max for the to do items ID. And in order to do that, we just, oh, sorry, uh, this is incorrect. This is not maps. It mm, should be map. We're mapping this math max function over the IDs of individual to-do lists, to-do items, sorry. Okay, so now we have the max ID. So the last thing we want to do is we want to say to do is the push, which is the JavaScript function to just add a new light item to the list. And here we're going to say the ID is the max ID plus one because we want to increment it by one. Um, the complete is going to be false because every time we add a new item, the, the completion is going to be false. And the name is going to be the request, sorry request.body.name. There we go. Okay, so the last thing we need to do is we need to update this file. So again, I'm just gonna copy and paste this code here because it's gonna be exactly the same. And this should be it, this should be up and running. Okay, great, so let's test this out. Again, it's a post to the to-do and it requires a name in the post payload. So I'm gonna just reset my server. I'm gonna go back into Postman. I'm going to duplicate this request. I'm gonna change it to post. It needs to be a to-do. And in the body, we need to set it to a raw JSON. And here we're just gonna say name is um, I don't know, um, complete the JS course. Great, let's send this, and it says status was okay. Let's go back to our to-dos, make a call and see what's happening. And sure enough, we have a fourth and new to-do list, completion false, complete the JS course. And as we're approaching the end of the programming part of this course, and we're gonna we're about to start to do the AWS uploading part. So what we're gonna do is just, we're gonna complete the to-do item of four. Go back here, see the completion is true, excellent. So we have successfully completed the programming part of this course. Uh, now we're gonna you know, wrap things up and start to see how we can deploy this application to AWS using Fargate. And welcome back to the second part of this course where we will uh, basically deploy our application into AWS Fargate. So as I mentioned before, uh, Fargate is a solution developed by AWS, which allows you to run your applications on the cloud without having to manage the resources or the underlying resources that host your application, right? So typically, uh, when when you deploy an application, you have to provision all of the resources. So provision the virtual machines, uh, install all of the different uh, dependencies that you need, so on and so forth. And uh, you know more frequently that's being automated using Docker. And AWS Fargate is another way to do that. But uh, the really interesting thing about AWS Fargate is it it completely takes away all of the management of the underlying infrastructure. So typically, as I said before, you would need to provision a cluster and manage the resources on that cluster and you know just make sure that it's not, uh, you don't have too many resources because then you're paying too much for what you need or you, you have too little resources and hence that could be affecting the performance of your application, right? So AWS Fargate is a solution where you just upload the image of your Docker uh, with your application inside it. And then AWS Fargate basically takes care of the rest, right? So it's a really, really convenient solution. It's very cost effective. Uh, you won't incur into any costs during the course of, of this uh, you know, course. Um, the downside to AWS Fargate is that it's a little finicky to set up if you don't know what you're doing, right? 
but that's the whole purpose of the second part of this course is we're going to go through together in into you know actually configuring AWS Fargate and get it up and running. So without further ado, let's get started. So I'm here back in our project that we finished up coding in the last section. And so now the first thing that we need to do in order to start the process of getting it pushed to AWS Fargate is to Dockerize our app. How do we do that? First of all, we need to install Docker on our machine if we haven't done so already. So we won't spend too much time into explaining how do you install Docker. Uh, you have this website docs.docker.com forward slash get dash Docker, where you can read all about how to install Docker on your individual platform. For Mac, it's very simple. You just have to download and drag the application to the applications folder as you do with pretty much anything on Mac. I believe for Linux, it's fairly simple too, and Windows shouldn't be too, too, too difficult either. In any case, when you have Docker installed, you should be able to open up the Docker application uh, and make sure it's running before you do anything. So here I have it uh, open, so that's great. Now I can go back to the Visual Studio Code project and we can start Dockerizing our application. So the first thing you need to do whenever you're Dockerizing an application is you need to create a new file and it's it has to be called exactly Docker file and the D has to be capital. Okay, so it's Docker file without anything else. So we click enter to create the file and now we can proceed to write our Docker file. Okay, so what is a Docker file? A Docker file is essentially a set of instructions for Docker in order for Docker to be able to recreate the environment your application needs in order to work, right? Um, so it, it's fairly simple to do. Um, and we're gonna go right now and, and kind of, you know, just write up the Docker file from scratch. It only has a couple of like 10 lines of code or something. It's not really code, it's just like, basic Docker instructions, right? So the first thing a, any Docker file needs is it needs to know what operating system it's running on or um, what's kind of equivalent is what base image are we using? So a base image is a kind of template image for Docker to kind of pull and use that, right? So a base image could be a a distribution of Linux or a ver version of Linux, or it can be a any kind of already pre-built uh, Docker image uh, that can then host your application. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to write from node colon 12, and this tells Docker that we're going to be using the pre-built Docker image called node uh, colon 12. And this basically says, it's a ran it's an arbitrary version of Linux. I'm not really entirely sure actually what version of Linux it is uh, with node version 12 installed on it. So so this basically, you know, this single line of code in the Docker file abstracts for us a bunch of different things that we would otherwise have to do. So this is super convenient. The next thing we're gonna do is we're going to declare our work dir. So this is done by typing work dir. And I'm just simply going to say forward slash app. So this is basically similar to, you know, just creating a app directory in, inside of our container and setting it as our working directory. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set the environment ver variable and say node env, env is equal to production. Sorry. And basically what this does is it forces the environment variable node env to be set to production. This is just a common thing I do whenever, you know, in a node application, just so that node knows that it's a production environment. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to copy package star.json to dot forward slash. What does this command do? It basically copies both the package and the package log files 
uh, into the working directory, so forward slash app. Uh, we need these to be able to npm install all of our dependencies, um, which is going to be the next thing that we do. So we need to tell Docker to run a command of npm install, okay? So by this point, Docker will execute npm install and obviously npm is already installed inside of the container because we pulled from the base image of node and obviously you know, node being the base image of node already has node and npm installed on it. So this is great. The next thing we need to do is we need to copy all of the source files. And the way you do this is you write copy dot space dot. Okay, so this is like super strange, but um, it's actually very, very intuitive. So what we're telling Docker to do is uh, we're copying everything from the current project directory. So everything that's inside here and we're past pasting it to the working directory. So by by typing in the instruction work there forward slash app, we're basically creating this directory and, you know, sending it to our you know, working directory inside of the container. So what we're telling Docker here to do is copy everything from the current directory on the on the project to the current directory in the in, in the container, right? So next thing we need to do is we need to run another um, command, which is npm install uh, dash g pm two. What does this command do? It basically installs globally inside of the container a library called PM2. PM2 is basically a library that's uh, much better to execute your Node application in, in, in a production scenario. Um, it's not really a good practice in production to do node index.js and kind of have uh, the application run that way. Reason being is it's not the most efficient way to do it. And also if your app crashes, then the whole process crashes and, you know, just crashes, right? And and there's no, no process, you know, realizing that the app has crashed and trying to get it back up and running again. And that's exactly what PM2 does for us, right? So once that's done, we need to expose the port 3000 because that's the port that our application is running on. And then finally, we need to run a command, which is pm2 runtime and then index.js. So this would be the equivalent of in the terminal saying pm2 uh, runtime and index.js, right? Uh, and this is done by, by just typing in cmd and then in, in a array format, typing in the different, uh, well, the, the command and the arguments to, to PM2, right? And this is basically it, right? So I'm going to save this and we need to do one more thing before we actually build the, the Docker image. And that is to create another new file and call it dot Docker ignore. What are we going to put inside of this file? Basically, we're just going to type in node modules. And that's it. Save it and that's it. What is this doing? What is this dot docker ignore file doing? Well, basically, um, you know, in, in this step, we're telling Docker to copy everything from the current file to the, you know, to the appropriate working directory inside of the container. However, we do not want to copy the node modules fo folder from our, you know, project directory. Why is that? Well, because first of all, you know, in my case, I'm running on a Mac and when I did, when I installed all of the node modules for my project on my machine, basically what NPM and node does is it installs the, some of the version, some of the libraries are going to be tailor-made for your operating system. Um, and obviously that's a problem when you're, when you're porting your application to a, a another operating system, then you will inevitably break things. Um, so the common best practice in the industry is to every time you're uploading a application to Docker, you just build the the or you do the npm install from scratch. So essentially, you're kind of like building the application from scratch on the environment it's going to be working on. 
So when we run npm install on this Linux, uh, Linux container, then npm will make sure that it's installing the, the right versions for Linux uh, every time. And then we can just simply copy all of the other source files. So that means this index.js, the store and the todos.json and everything else, right? Um, so we're going to be copying everything except for node modules. That's why that's where the dot docker ignore uh, file comes in handy because here we can just list everything we want to ignore in the copy step. Okay. Excellent. So now with that done, basically we can go ahead and start to upload this to our AWS um, account. Okay. So I've op opened up. Okay. So I've opened up my AWS account. And the first thing we, that we need to search here is something called ECR. So this stands for Elastic Container Registry. Here it is. And we need to create a new registry, a container registry, which will hold our um, Docker image. So the way we do this is we just click here, create new repository, JS01, and leave all of the other settings default, and that's it, right? So here we've created a new repository. And now if I click into it and you can see this button view push commands, and these are all of the different instructions that I need to carry out in order to push my Docker image uh, to AWS ECR. So I'm going to just here, we have a handy icon to just copy all of the commands and I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. Okay, so I have my terminal open. And I'm just gonna now sequentially, you know, uh, paste all of the different commands into into the terminal. So this first command is to log into our AWS ECR account. Login succeeded. Going to go back, copy the second one, which is a Docker build. So here we're we're essentially just building our uh, Docker Docker image out of the the project and and all of the different files. Okay, so the build process is complete. It might take a little while. Uh, now the next thing we need to do is we need to tag our Docker image on our local computer with a address to where we're going to be up, up the, uploading our Docker image. So let's just do that. This is going to take very little, it's very quick. And the last thing we need to do, to do is we need to actually, after tagging it, to push our uh, container to ECR. So let's do that right now. Okay, so that took a little while in my case, but it's finished, which is great. So now if we go back here uh, to our repository and we refresh, then we'll see that we have a new Docker image. So this is great. Now, the next thing that we need to do is we need to actually start to set up our uh, Elastic Container Service Cluster. So how do we do that? Uh, let's now search for ECS, which stands for Elastic Container Service. Okay, so now we're in the ECS uh, page where, where we can start creating our AWS Fargate cluster. So the first thing we need to do is now that we have our Docker image pushed to the uh, Elastic con Container repository, we can go ahead and create a cluster. You will uh, probably not see anything here. I've been doing a couple of tests and that's why you see some other clusters here, but let's uh, create one from scratch. So we're gonna create a, a cluster and make it uh, networking only, uh, powered by AWS Fargate, next step. And here, all we have to do is we need to uh, assign a name. So I'm gonna cl call it cluster JS01. That's kind of the short code I use for this course. Uh, we want to make sure that we don't click on create a new VPC. Reason being is that AWS already provisions a default VPC that we're going to be using when you open up an account. Uh, so that's why we're not going to be creating one. Uh, so let's go ahead and click Create, View Cluster. Now we can see that we have a cluster created. Now, a cluster is essentially kind of, you know, Kind of what the name suggests, right? It's a grouping of different compute resources that we will be using to host our application. In this case, and for, for the purpose of the, 
of this course, we're just going to have one set of compute resources, which AWS calls tasks uh, to run our application, right? So you can see here a tab called tasks. Uh, this is the tab that we're going to go to to monitor the compute resources that we have uh, running our application. But before we do that, we need to create a task definition because a task definition is, you know, what again, what the name suggests is a definition of these compute resources that are going to be, uh, you know, running our, our application. So let's go into task definitions. And here we have, I already have a couple of tasks done, but um, let's create one from scratch again. We need to make sure it's a Fargate task. Click next, give it a name. So this will be task def js01, for example, in my case. And then basically all of the other kind of values here are gonna be default. Uh, we're not gonna create a task role. We're gonna leave all of these default. And then here, very important, um, for the purpose of the of this course, again, we're gonna select the smallest values. And, and you know, this is kind of the section where we define, you know, the amount of memory and the amount of CPU power that we want for our, you know, instance that's going to be running our application. So again, uh, here it's called tasks. A task is basically a defined uh, set of compute resources, which we're defining here that are going to be running our, our application. We also need to define the container that we're going to be um, spinning up inside of this task. Uh, so let's go ahead and click add container. And here is where we're going to be, um, you know, linking the container that we just uploaded to the Elastic Container Registry. So let's just call it container uh, to do, or sorry, I have a typo here, uh, JS01 maybe. It doesn't really matter. And now here we need to copy the URL um, that we can use to address the, the container image that we just opened uh, or just uploaded. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a, a new tab and I'm going to go to ECR. So the Elastic Container Registry. And once I'm inside, I'm going to basically go to the repository that we just created where we pushed our image, yes, your one latest, and here we have the image URI, which we can just copy, go back to the previous tab and paste it in here. Uh, this we can keep the default soft limit of 128 megs for the memory limit. And here in the port map this is very, very important that we enter 3000 in the TCP port mapping. Why is this? Well, if you recall, if we go back to our application, we're essentially telling Express to listen to inbound traffic on the port 3000. And this is also why in the Docker file, we expose the port 3000. So traffic is going to be coming into the container on port 3000. And then inside of the container, Express is going to be listening to the port 3000. So this is why we need to map uh, and make sure that, you know, our our um, you know, task definition opens up port 3000 uh, for the container. And all of the other values we can just skip, leave blank and click add. Okay, once that's done, all of the rest of the values we can just you know, leave default and we can create the task definition. Excellent, so this is created. We can go back to the cluster and the next thing we want to do is now we um, we need to go to the cluster that we created previously. So it's cluster JS01. And here we, under a ser the services tab, we need to create a new service. So a new service is basically linking the cluster to the task definition that we just created. And when we start the service, the service is essentially the thing that's going to be monitoring and making sure that all of our tasks are healthy and up and running, right? Um, so let's create a service. Let's select Fargate as the service type. Under task definition, let's uh, select the task definition that we just created. So task def JSR1 in my case. Let's give the service a name. So service JSR1. Number of tasks, let's keep it to one. And here we have a set of minimum health percent and maximum percent, 100 and 200. These are just defaults, leave them as they are. Uh, these are kind of made for um, auto scaling purposes. 
we're not really going to play with them uh, in this course. So just leave them default and then we can hit next. And here we need to select the VPC. So this is the default VPC that AWS has provisioned. And then under subnets, we need to just select all of the subnets, right? The, um, the amount of subnets that you have may vary. And that depends on how many subnets AWS has provisioned under your uh, account as default. And that kind of depends also on the region that you're using. I'm using the North Virginia region, but this doesn't really matter what region you're using. And then next, it's extremely important that you edit this security group. Uh, when we edit it, we want to create a new security group. And here we want to make sure that um, we select custom TPC, uh, sorry, custom TCP and enter the port 3000. Again, this is the port that uh, our container and our application is using and the source accepts traffic from anywhere, basically. So we want to hit save, uh, auto sign public IP enabled. Uh, and then also very important, we want to make sure that we select a application load balancer under load balancer type. Why is this? Uh, and by the way, when you select this, this input field will pop up and we need to change this value to something like 30, 30 be being 30 seconds. Now, what is all of this application load balancer and health check grace period? Well, as I mentioned already previously, AWS Fargate is a AWS product that basically enables you to auto scale your application. And what that means is that if you have a little amount of traffic, then you will likely just have one task or one set of compute resources running your application. But as you get more traffic and as those compute resources are being saturated, AWS will automatically spin up new tasks or new set of compute resources to, to manage that workload, right? And the only way that you can have a single entry point being, let's say, for example, a domain name and have that load of, or that you know bulk of traffic being distributed equally to the different um, compute resources or tasks that you may have sp uh, spun up, the only way to do that is if you use a application load balancer. So in essence, the traffic will be directed to a application load balancer and this application load balancer will be configured in such a way that it distributes traffic equally to all of the compute resources that AWS Fargate spins up for you. Okay. Um, and what is this value of 30 seconds here? Well, a application load balancer has what's called a health check. And a health check is basically just a periodic ping it does to your website every uh, X amount of seconds. And it evaluates if your application is responding a, a, a good status code. So basically a status code of 200. Now, sometimes as your application is still spinning up, um, you know, it might not be fully responsive. Um, so this health check grace period is basically telling, okay, you know, if you're not expecting the right um, kind of uh, HTTP, HTTP status code, you know, just wait for 30 seconds before you deem it to be unhealthy and tell AWS Fargate or ECS in this case um, to kind of restart that task, right? Um, so that's all of that that's happening here. Now, under load balancer name, um, you will likely not have anything. Um, you will have this empty and AWS will be prompting to you that you need to create a load balancer. Um, so go and click on that link. Um, meanwhile, I'm going to go to the same page that you will be directed to. And we will create a new application load balancer from scratch. Okay, so here I am in the application load balancer page, which you will be directed to. Again, you won't have anything here. This is just a previous test I, I made. Um, so create a new load balancer and make sure you select the HTTP or, or HTTPS load balancer, hit create. Here we need to give it a name. So I'm gonna call it application load balancer uh, JS01. We need to make sure it's internet facing IPv4 and the listener is set to HTTP port 80. Now, why are we mapping port 80 on the application load balancer? Well, as I said before, the application load balancer is going to be the internet facing side of things. So um, it needs to listen to the default port that you know every website uses. So right now I'm accessing the AWS um, uh, console uh, through port 80. 
um, if I were to open up Google, um, you know, again, any typical website is hosted on port 80 and, and that's just the default, right? So we're going to be listening in to incoming traffic from the internet on port 80. Uh, next, we're going to just, you know, select the default VPC and select all the subnets as we did before. And then we're going to hit next. Uh, we're going to skip the security settings. And here we need to create a new security group. Um, so we're just going to leave the default name. We're going to set custom TCP. And we're going to, you know, allow it to, to listen to traffic on port 80. Um, from anywhere. We're going to hit uh, next. And here, very importantly, we're going to uh, configure the target group. What is a target group? A target group is a kind of, uh, as the name suggests, it's a way of for the application load balancer to understand what is it targeting. So what is it going to be forwarding traffic to? And so naturally, we need to create a target uh, group and link it to the all of the different tasks that are going to be created by uh, AWS Fargate or ACS. So let's uh, create a name for this. This is going to be TG for a target group and just call it JSR1. We need to make sure it's an IP-based target group and then we can leave the rest of the values default. Now, this part is very important. Um, in, in my case, I need to leave this default, um, but in your case, it may vary. If you follow the course, the, the coding part of the course exactly as I've done, then you will also have to leave it default. So basically, we need to enter the path to our application for whatever you know endpoint that we created that returns this hello world. Okay. So uh, why do we have to do this? Well, this health check is going to, as I said before, ping this uh, path. So so you know it's going to ping this controller every set amount of seconds and kind of evaluate what the status code for the response is. If the status code is anything other than a, a successful status code, so basically a, a 200, uh, or it takes too long to respond, then it's going to tell uh, ECS and AWS Fargate that, you know, the, the, the application is not responding and it's going to tell it to restart that task. And that's something we do not want if our application is in fact running healthy. So please make sure that you enter here the path of, uh, of the equivalent uh, controller or, or the HTTP handler that you implemented with a hello world um, you know, response here. Okay, next, register task. This we're going to leave default, review, and hit create. Excellent. So we just created a application load balancer called JSR1. We're, we're going to go back here to, to the step where we were creating the service. And we're going to just refresh this list and select the newly created a out application load balancer JSR01. Okay. The container to load balance part. Uh, here we can see that we have the container, JS01, already loaded for us. Uh, we're going to add it to the load balancer. And here, here, while we're at it, this is also very important that we uh, configure this correctly. So the listening port needs to be 80 HTTP. So this is basically um, the, the, the inbound traffic to the load balancer is going to be on port 80. And then the target group is going to be this target group JS01 that we created. Um, so basically, this is how we're linking this service to the target group I was just talking about, right? So this is how we're telling the application load balancer that it needs to forward all of the traffic that it, it, uh, it receives to the service that we're creating, which is also going to host our application inside of our container. Okay. Next step, we're going to skip this part of auto scaling. Although this is a, a really nice feature of AWS Fargate, we're not really going to be using it for this course. We're going to hit next and create. Okay, so our service is created. Now, as I refresh this, you will start to see that we are going to start to provision resources for application. Here we are. Uh, AWS Fargate is provisioning resources. The desired state is going to be running. The last known state is provisioning. So this will take maybe a minute or two. 
So when it's done, I'll come back. Okay, and our task is running. So let's click into the task. And here, if we, if we open up this dialog, we can go and see the logs in CloudWatch and just, just, just for demonstration purposes, uh, we'll be able to see that if, oh, uh, we'll be able to see that our application has started correctly. So here we are, the logs. This is the, the log that we always see in our console when we start the application. Application is running on HTTP localhost 3000. Now this is obviously localhost, you know, from within the container, but in actual fact, our application is already internet and public facing. So let's go back here. And we can see that under network, we have been assigned a public IP. So let's copy this, enter it into our browser and add the port 3000 with a colon here. And successfully, we can see that our application is in fact running. This is the hello world for our application. So this is excellent. Uh, we're up and running. And now if we go back to the um, load balancer, here in the load balancer, we can also see that uh, it has been assigned a DNS name. So let's copy this and go to our application and enter it. And here we can see that our application is also accessible through the load balancer. So this is great because now if I go into first slash to do's, we can see the initial set of to do's that we created, right? So this is all nice and working. Our application is live. It's on the public internet. And the last thing we can do optionally is to set up a domain name so that instead of accessing you know, our application through the IP address I just entered or this very, very long, you know, address for the load balancer, it can be uh, accessed through a custom domain name that we can buy. Okay, so now that we have everything up and running, the last and optional step that we have that we can do is we can configure our app to be accessible through a custom domain name. So instead of having to type as I did previously, instead of having to type this very long URL, which is provided to us by AWS and, and we cannot really change it, um, but that's not really an issue because typically uh, you do not access the app over this URL. Instead you buy a custom dom na domain name, whichever one you want, and you redirect traffic from that domain name to the load balancer. And this is completely then transparent to the user. The user doesn't really know that the, their request is being uh, forwarded to this uh, application load balancer. And they, they never see this URL, in fact. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, the AWS product that uh, we use to buy and map domain names is called Grout. 53. So I'm going to look for route 53 here in the search box. Then here you can see that in my case, I have two different domain names that I've already bought in the, on, under this account. Um, so I'm going to click here to access my domain names. And this is the list of, of my domain names. Now, if, if you don't have any domain names here, you can register a new domain name by accessing or by clicking here in register domain names. And here you can, uh, you know, just uh, click register domain and, and kind of search for a domain name and, and, and buy it from here directly. So I'm going to go back to the dashboard. And from here, I'm going to click onto the hosted zones again to see the list of my uh, domain names. I'm going to click on the javascript.academy and here uh, you can see that by default, AWS creates certain mappings for your domain name, right? We, we're not going to go into too much detail on what these are. Instead, we just want to create a new record. And we're going to keep the simple routing in place. And here we can choose to either map the, the root domain name. So if we leave this blank, we would be mapping the javascript.academy domain to our load balancer. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, map the the subdomain of JS01 to my load balancer. Uh, so I'm going to enter JS01. This can be whatever you want it to be. It can be three W's, for example. It can be whatever you want, right? Um, and I'm going to switch on the alias 
uh, because this then will allow us to map uh, or route the traffic to a alias to application and classic load balancer. This is exactly what we want. And now we have to choose the region where our application load balancer is hosted. In my case, this is uh, North Virginia. So it would be US East 1, North Virginia. And then finally, here we choose which load balancer to route it to. So in my case, it's the one I just created with you guys. It's ALBJS01. And basically, this is it, right? I'm going to create the record. And basically, that's it. The record is created and the mapping is done. So now, this, this, this may not... Um, you know, take effect immediately. So if you copy and paste this to your browser and it doesn't work, you just need to wait a bit. But um, more often than not, it works immediately. So as you can see now, my application load balancer and hence my uh, Express application inside of the AWS Fargate container is accessible through my custom domain name. So it's js js onejavascriptacademy and in your case, you can just buy any old domain name and map any subdomain or, in fact, you know, the entire domain name. So I could have, if I left the JS01 part blank, I could have mapped, you know, the entire domain name, the JavaScript.academy to uh, the application load balancer and hence my application. So now if I go to, to forward slash to do's, oops, sorry, uh, I forgot, I, I deleted the subdomain domain. So if I go to the subdomain and the forward slash to do's, you know, as, as expected, the application is up and running correctly. Great, so, and, and as you can see, uh, this is, as I said before, totally transparent to the user, right? Um, here, from here, we cannot see that we're in fact, in fact, forwarding the traffic to our application load balancer. Right, so this concludes the quick uh, course on backend app development with Node.js and hosting your backend application using AWS Fargate. I hope you really enjoyed the course. And if you did, uh, please leave an honest review on the course on, on Udemy. And uh, if you enjoyed the course and you enjoyed backend development with Node.js and AWS Fargate, then stay tuned because I'm going to be releasing more advanced courses where we will learn how to um, you know, create production grade applications where we store information in AWS DynamoDB. So it's uh, AWS uh, database, um, which is used to, to store information instead of sort storing it on the phys physical hard drive as we're doing in, in, in this course. Um, and we will learn uh, many more uh, advanced ways of uh, just basically writing more, more production grade applications. So stay tuned for that if you like the course. And for now, uh, thank you very much for, for taking this free course. And I hope to see you guys in the next one. Take care.